Hello everyone. Welcome to the third event of the Bay Area Association of Kidney Patients online series, Ask the Expert. I'm Patrick Barron. Today we focus on the important topic of choosing the right dialysis option for you. Our guest this time is Dory Chattel, who along with nephrologist Dr. John Agar has authored this new book, Help I Need Dialysis. A warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today, Dory. Congratulations on the new book. To get us started, <clears throat> tell us who this book is for and why patients need to read this book. Thanks, uh, Patrick. This book actually has several different audiences, and the, the most important one maybe is people whose kidneys are failing and they're at the point of needing to choose a treatment. So those patients and their families, also people who are already on dialysis and maybe they're not happy with their treatment and they're looking to switch, which can be done at any time, and their families, and then also professionals who want to know more about the various home options so that they can better advise their patients. So it's kind of a triple audience. Great. Um, Dory, now we have a, a varied uh, audience in our group. Uh, some folks that are actually just been told that they've or just been diagnosed with kidney disease, and then there's a lot of other folks that have been on dialysis for a while, um, but particularly for the folks that this is new to, and in fact many folks uh, that uh, might have been on dialysis for a while still may not know of uh, these other options in terms of modalities. So would you kindly take us through the main modalities uh, described in your book and give us a sense of what each one is? Sure. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, explain these sort of in order of how much kidney replacement therapy each one gives you just like we do in the book so most people in the US who need dialysis end up doing what we call standard in-center hemo so that would be going to a clinic three days a week and usually getting three to four hours we hope it's four hours we actually good data that it shouldn't be less than four hours but that's that's the dialysis that most people are familiar with. You go to a clinic, you have a set time slot, it's three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and the technician generally is doing the treatment with a nurse supervising. That's about the least kidney replacement that somebody can get. Peritoneal dialysis would be a little bit more, it's not really much more re kidney replacement, but it's given in a more continuous way. So for peritoneal dialysis, instead of putting needles into an access in your arm like you might do for hemodialysis, you would actually have a surgeon place a tube called a catheter either right through the wall of the belly or into the chest down into the belly. That's called a pre-sternal PD catheter. They're, they're rarer, but um, they have some advantages. And that therapy is done by actually putting bags of sterile fluid, using that tube to, to drain those bags of sterile fluid right into the belly where they stay for a while. And then the, the capillary blood vessels, I'm talking with my hands but you can't see it, the capillary blood vessels that line the inside of the belly called the peritoneum are actually act as the filter to clean the blood. And after that fluid has dwelled there for a while, you drain it back out and then you put fresh fluid in. You either do that by hand so we call that continuous ambulatory, which means walking around PD. Or you do it, most people do it with a cycler machine at night. So we call that continuous cycling PD or CCPD or sometimes automated PD, APD. And that's, as I said, that's a little bit more dialysis than standard and center, mostly because it's done continuously. So instead of just being done three days a week, you're doing it every day or every night. Short daily hemodialysis is generally done at home. There are a handful of clinics that offer it, but mostly not because it's just it's just too difficult to work that into the standard schedule. So for short daily hemo, you take home a special hemodialysis machine. Instead of being 
about the size of a four-drawer file cabinet, like a regular HEMO machine you might see in the clinic. This machine's about the size of a microwave oven. It weighs about 65 pounds. There are probably other new machines coming out, but right now that's this is the one. The next stage machine is the one that is generally used for short daily. And you do a treatment five or six days a week on your own schedule. So you can do it in the morning, you can do it in the afternoon, you can do it in the evening, you can switch from one to the other just so you get that treatment in. And you do a treatment that may be two and a half to four hours long, five or six days a week. And so that's sort of PD-like in terms of letting you feel pretty good every day, not having those ups and downs like you might have from only getting three treatments a week. But it's really all told maybe just a little bit more dialysis than standard in center or PD. And then finally there's nocturnal chemo and that can be done in a center three times a week and that's actually one of the fastest growing treatments. So you would go to that clinic and you would have the techs do your treatment but it would be an eight hour long treatment. You might go into the clinic at eight or nine o'clock at night and then be done at about four o'clock in the morning. And that works really well for some people and, and not so well for other people. Like if you're not a morning person that that might be a little challenging for you. But it does give you twice as much dialysis. If you do nocturnal hemo at night in your own home, you actually can do that up to six nights a week. And occasionally, I've even heard of people doing all seven nights because they just feel better that way. And then you're at home in your own bed and you're sleeping. And so the dialysis itself, you get way more than with any other treatment except for transplant. And you have the convenience of it not taking over your day because you're doing it at night. So that's that's kind of a quick overview. Great. So in terms of, uh, for the person that's really looking to sort of the, minimize the amount of time that they're on dialysis, particularly as it takes up their day, right. the time in their day, you're looking at the two nighttime options, which is um, the PD cycler, and then you're looking at the nighttime hemo. And what's exactly. the sort of relative time there that you're spending per week? It, well, most people who use a PD cycler at night are connected for somewhere between 8 and 10 hours. I've heard more. It shouldn't really probably be necessary to do more. Generally, if you need more than, than 10 hours, it's not a bad idea to add a daytime exchange. So you'd be talking 70 hours, I guess, if you were doing 10 hours a day with a cycler, or at night, 10 hours at night with a cycler. But it's not during the day, so it's not... You know, maybe maybe an hour or two of it would fall during the day, but mostly not. If you do nocturnal hemo and you're able to sleep through it, and most people can, but not everybody, then it might be 48 hours of dialysis a week. You might do it every other night, in which case it would be, you know, whatever that ends up being, 32 hours a week. It It's a lot more dialysis than just getting 9 to 12 hours like you would with standard and center. Great. Now, um... Dory, a big emphasis in your book is looking at these different dialysis options and looking at your lifestyle. And you emphasize and say, look, you know, um, you have to deal with dialysis for health reasons. It's great because it actually keeps you alive. And you're looking at it in a very positive way and saying, look, there's a number of different options that you have out there. And what's important is that you look at your lifestyle and you look at uh, how these different treatments actually in impact your lifestyle and which one actually is the best one for you. So from the patient perspective, how does one actually go about finding the right dialysis option to fit a particular lifestyle? Take, for example, you know, one of the big restrictions uh, with kidney disease, whether it's pre-dialysis or by your own, on dialysis, is diet. You know. You know, restricting when you're on dialysis, I had to watch the amount of liquid I was consuming every day. You got to watch your uh, phosphorus levels. So, how does one, um, if you take the the issue of uh, just eating and drinking, explain to us what the different trade offs are there? Sure. And eating and drinking is a really good example because. It we all eat and drink, at least we would all like to be eating and drinking, and what I hear from patients is that that is the most challenging thing for a lot of people, is is just being limited on um, what they're able to eat and drink. So if the, 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 the sort of rule of thumb to keep in mind is that more dialysis is more like having healthy kidneys. The more treatment you get, the less work you have to do by limiting your intake. 
So when your treatment is removing more fluid and removing more waste, you can eat a little more and drink a little more normally. And that's a pretty big deal. So if you do standard and center hemo, like you noticed, you were limited for how much fluid you could drink. You also are limited for how much sodium you can have, how much potassium you can have. You're trying to keep an eye on, on um, phosphorus. So you're, you're either limiting your phosphorus or taking binders or both. And then you also may be looking at um, protein, depending on you know what your protein levels look like in your blood. And if you have diabetes, you're also trying to keep track of sugar and starch and carbs. So it gets to be really complicated and difficult. For people who do PD, generally what I hear from them is that they are less limited. They can have a little more fluid because they're removing fluid all the time. They can sometimes have a little more sodium, a little more phosphorus, a little more potassium. It depends, and obviously what an individual person can do is going to be based on their lab test results. But there generally is a little bit more freedom. With short daily hemo, a little less concern about the fluid because you're removing that fluid every day. It doesn't remove as much phosphorus as, say, nocturnal, but maybe a little bit more. On the other hand, that can be balanced by people having a better appetite and eating more. And so sometimes folks who do short daily don't end up with any needing any fewer binders because they're, they're eating better, because they feel better. Folks on nocturnal, generally the first two medications that they do away with are blood pressure pills, which is also true for, for folks who do short daily, and those binders. When you do nocturnal hemo, you don't generally need the binders because nocturnal hemo removes so much phosphorus that some people actually need supplements. Oh, and wow. so, I know, right? Can you even imagine? <laughs> so, you know, and people who do nocturnal hemo, depending on how many nights a week, they may not have any fluid limits at all, and they may not have any limits on potassium either. Again, it always depends on your blood levels, and everybody's mileage can vary. But in general, there are fewer limits with nocturnal hemo, just as there are fewer limits with transplant. Okay, great. Um, now, you know, the other thing is there are a surprisingly large number of folks that are still trying to maintain a job, and then they're diagnosed with kidney disease. They still need to sort of support their family. So coming at it from um, a work point of view, how do these different modalities stack up? I imagine one would be leaning towards the nocturnal modes, which is for PD and HD, but then I've also seen an amazing number of people that, uh, I wouldn't say amazing, but a number of people um, actually carry around their uh, bag and do it at work. But uh, give us your thought on uh, trying to find the right option for work, people that are still work. When, when you want to work, when, when you need to work, because your bills aren't stopping just because your kidneys have stopped, and disability, if you take it, tends to pay about one-third as much as whatever job you made. So I don't know about you, but I know that if my income were cut by two-thirds, it would be a real problem for my lifestyle. So if you want to be able to keep working, you need to choose a treatment option that is what we call work-friendly. And by work-friendly, we mean you have some control over the schedule and sometimes that can be in center hemo. I mean there are folks who dialyze, there are clinics that offer at late afternoon or evening shifts so that maybe you can work a first shift or you can work a, a regular you know nine to five job and then come in and I'm not sure when you're getting a chance to eat but you know come in at five or six o'clock at night and dialyze until say ten o'clock and then go home and go to sleep and get up in the morning and I know some people who do that and they make it work it's much more challenging when there isn't an afternoon or an evening shift and your job is during the day. So in most cases, standard and center hemo isn't very work friendly. The other aspects of work friendliness have to do with things like how you feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you feel like you have sort of a brain fog where you're not thinking very clearly? That can be a real problem for people who need to concentrate to work and, and who want to feel like they're putting in a, a legitimate effort. So I know some lawyers and some doctors who stopped working after they started standard and center hemo because they just didn't feel like they were up to snuff and didn't feel like it was fair to their employer. So mental concentration is an issue, physically how you feel. On average, people who do standard and center hemo end up in the hospital, I think it's something like 10 to 14 days a year. So missing work is, is something that can be a problem, and some people end up getting fired because they miss so much work. So a treatment that, that lets you feel better and keeps you out of the hospital is going to be more work-friendly. In that case, it, 
I'm not. I'd have to actually look in the book about PD, but but short daily hemo and nocturnal hemo much less likely to have you in the hospital. Fewer hospital days with those treatments. And as you said, having a treatment that you can do at night so that it isn't during the workday, that can make a big difference. Ease of travel can be important to some people for work because if you have to travel for work, you want a, tra a, a kind of a treatment that you can either take with you because it's portable, like peritoneal dialysis can be very portable, or um, possibly next stage where you can take it along on a trip. Otherwise, you have to schedule your treatments in center for travel. And for work, that just may not be possible because the time frame just usually doesn't allow enough lead time. You know, for, for in-center travel, you may have to make plans three, four, five months in advance. If you have a work tra trip that's coming up next week, that's not going to help you any. Okay. You know, looking, looking through the different modalities in your book uh, and listening to you uh, now, it sure looks like um, nocturnal hemodialysis has um, a lot of advantages in terms of one. One that surprised me was the amount of dialysis that you're getting in terms of the effectiveness of the treatment can be double what it is for the other treatment modalities. And in fact, uh, you mentioned that uh, with nocturnal hemo looking at your levels, you're the, at the equivalent of stage 3 kidney disease versus the others, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you're really just kept at a stage 5 level in terms of your blood toxin. Is that correct? That is right. And then, uh, so how do the folks, so medically you're also saying that uh, in terms of diet restrictions, in terms of the medications that you need to take, nocturnal dialysis looks like the winner. Um, how do folks that adopt it actually, if they require travel to be part of their lifestyle, whether it be a job or just recreational travel, how do they work that in? That's, that's one of the trade-offs. Nocturnal hemo has a lot of advantages, but ease of travel at this point is not necessarily among them. So if you travel and you do nocturnal, you might be lucky enough to um, be going somewhere where there's a, a clinic that offers in-center nocturnal so that rather than take a whole day out of your vacation or your work trip, maybe you can just go in at night from 8 o'clock and get off at 4 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, as long as that's a good neighborhood, that, that can be a pretty good option. If you can do nocturnal with a next stage machine, and some people do, it is not FDA approved for that. In fact, we're finding that we are safer saying, using the word extended for, for longer treatments rather than noc nocturnal because the, the Food and Drug Administration has not yet approved any machine specifically for nocturnal use. Now the machines are out on the market and they are used, but they're not specifically approved for that. So that treatment is a little hard to find right now. And even if it's the one you want, you may not be able to find it. So it's important to know about all of the others so that you can get started with something that lets you live your life and then pick something, you know, move into it, advocate for it, talk your doctor into it, a doctor can prescribe whatever therapy he or she wants to. But in terms of travel, you're either going to be going, looking for a nighttime clinic hours, taking your machine with you, or you're, you're back in that sort of queue of three or four or five months ahead, you have to ask for a standard in-center slot. And if you do that and you do nocturnal, it's vitally in, excuse me, important that you limit your potassium intake to the standard hemo diet. Uh, I am aware of one patient who traveled from doing nocturnal hemo, went to standard in-center hemo on a vacation and passed away due to a potassium overload because he wasn't used to following that diet and he hadn't been warned. So we do try to warn everybody. That's, that's a very good point when you're switching modalities in a travel situation. Right. <clears throat> you know, now, I, I was um, on dialysis briefly in 2007, and at the time, uh, I don't, be, don't remember being aware of all of the modalities. There were certainly in-center hemo, which is finally what I chose for a short-term uh, period of a couple months. Um, they were also talking about um, home hemo, but give us a sense in terms of the availability of these four um, modes of dialysis today. How widespread, how available? 
We we actually have we have a database on our Home Dialysis Central website. So that's homedialysis.org, and it's searchable. We try to keep that up to date with every clinic in the U.S. that actually trains people to do any type of home dialysis. So whether that's PD, manual PD or cycler PD, short daily hemo, nocturnal hemo. And um, to some extent, but not as thorough, we also have some listings of in-center nocturnal. So at any given moment, if you go on that website and you look at our database, you can just click the box for the one treatment option you want to know about, let's say short daily, and you would find out that, say, out of the five or 6,000 clinics in the U.S., about 10% of them offer short daily. However, that covers almost all of the country. Nocturnal is a little bit less available now. PD, I think 40% of all of the clinics in the U.S. offer at least in-center hemo and PD. And of course, you know, virtually all of the clinics that are out there offer standard in-center hemo, but um, not quite all. There are just a handful of home-only treatment centers. Okay. Um, now, one of the other things you talk about is the importance of the role of the patient, really, as <clears throat> being in charge or taking charge of their health in general and a choice in the treatment, modality treatment. So can you give us your view in terms of uh, what you'd recommend to the patient uh, that's looking at a dialysis option or somebody that's been on dialysis for a while in terms of how do they work with their care system, both the dialysis center as well as the nephrologist that's in charge in uh, choosing one or modifying the modality that they're already on? That's a really good question, and thank you for asking that. It's really, really important to us that we convey to people who have any chronic disease, but especially chronic kidney disease, because it's so complicated, that you actually have a job. If your kidneys fail, you have a new job, and it isn't necessarily a job you asked for or wanted, but you have it nonetheless. because. Our whole healthcare system is set up for what we call acute illness. So let's say you have appendicitis. So you have appendicitis, your, your belly hurts, you, you go to the doctor. Your job as a patient who has appendicitis is to seek good care and do as you're told. So you're going to have surgery, you're going to have your appendix out, and then you're going to be cured and you're going to feel better and you're going to go home. And you're going to resume your life and you'll have a scar to show for you know, your, your ordeal that you went through. But kidney disease isn't like that. It's, um, it's not something where you can just sort of go in and they'll fix you and you can go home. It's a chronic disease. You have it for the rest of your life. And you may go through several different doctors. You may outlive several doctors. I know lots of people who outlived several of their doctors. So if you don't know your own history and you don't know how you feel, how are you going to share that with a new care team? You can't necessarily rely on, you know, my your, your one doctor being there. You have a job that involves finding a way to stay positive in all of this. And you pointed out that the book is positive. We, we do try to help people stay positive. There is a silver lining here. In, in the 1950s, if your kidneys failed, that was it. There was nothing that they could really do for you. If you had chronic kidney failure, there wasn't any treatment. It wasn't until the 1960s that chronic dialysis was even possible. And the people who got that dialysis back then went through a life and death committee to get it and not everybody got it. In fact, most people didn't. There weren't enough machines, there weren't enough dialyzers to go around. So having a disease where there is a treatment, where you can live for decades, is a gift. There are lots of diseases out there where there are no good treatments and where you get very bad news and there's really not much that, that we can do to help you. This isn't like that. There is a lot of good news. You know, does anybody want dialysis? No. but but there is dialysis, and there are a lot of diseases where people wish there were a treatment like dialysis that could help them. So your job is to stay positive, to learn as much as you can, and then to take an active role with your care team. So if you ask them good questions and you work with them as a team, then you both can work together to produce good health outcomes for yourself. My own time uh, at dialysis uh, I always wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. So if the dialysis technicians even suggested that it may be better for me to do four-hour dialysis, 
I would be inclined to fight with them. They were sympathetic and they said, well, we'll probably try to get you out here, out of here in three or three and a half hours. And quite frankly, it's really through a lack of understanding of the importance of that extra time uh, being necessary for health reasons. So um, <clears throat> clearly these factors, uh, just being knowledgeable about it, uh, helps a lot in terms of staying healthy and perhaps living longer. Absolutely. How, how did you feel after those three-hour treatments? Uh, I felt, uh, you had a much better uh, description for it, but foggy, just my mind felt uh, very foggy and it would take me, I was in dialysis in the afternoon, uh, pretty much for the rest of that evening uh, I would be in that fog, it would clear overnight, uh, so yeah, it, it was uh, not very pleasant. We call that recovery time that period of how long does it take you after a treatment to feel good again and that really differs a lot by the treatment so for PD while you're doing it all the time there there basically there is no recovery time some people feel a little um, tired after an exchange because of the sugar in it but for the most part people feel the same all the time no roller coaster you are on the roller coaster people who do standard and center hemo have said that it can take as long as seven hours to recover after each treatment so if you do a treatment at say nine o'clock in the morning and you're done off the machine at twelve thirty you might not feel good again until seven or eight o'clock that night so it doesn't just take the time out of your day that is for the treatment and the driving and the waiting and the sitting in the waiting room it also can take that recovery time so for short daily the recovery time is about half an hour after each treatment which is not too bad and for nocturnal, it's about 10 minutes. So by the time you're done holding those needle sites, you're, you're good to go. Now, you know, I, I don't want to short circuit your thinking or your discussion, but you know, one of the things that uh, I noticed was that if you look at uh, nocturnal hemo, there are just so many pluses to it. You know, the biggest one being that, you know, you're the dialysis is much more thorough, so you're brought back up to a healthier state every night. Um, there is the issue of being hooked up through the night, but if for the person that's looking for a modality, Dory, would you suggest that they start with that since it seems like it's the healthiest and then see how that works with their lifestyle and then go from there as necessary? Generally, it's, um, I think it's kind of tricky for people to start out with nocturnal. It's, to do any type of home dialysis, a lot of clinics, not all, but most, require that you have a partner. So home hemo may not be an option for people who don't have a partner, depending on their clinic. There are clinics that allow it, but most don't. So your choices may be constrained by your living situation. And people have done various different things for partners, and sometimes the people who don't have partners, and I know a number of people who do home hemo by themselves with no partner, but they may have something like, um, oh, what do you call that, you know, that commercial with that lady, I've fallen and I can't get up, that sort of oh. panic button that you wear around your neck, I can't remember what those are yeah, called. But. I know the brand, it's First Alert. There like. you go, yes, exactly. So some clinics are comfortable with that. In New York State, I believe all home hemodialysis has to be monitored online, and so sometimes that monitoring can sort of suffice to be a, a partner, if you will. But um, hemo at all is a much steeper learning curve than PD. It's scarier for people because of the needles. It's best if people put their own needles in, even if they have a partner. Such a bad idea to have to, to put the burden of putting those needles in on somebody else if there is any way you can do it yourself. And by any way I mean you have a hand and you can you can feel your fingers and you know you can you can see well enough to figure out where that needle goes because otherwise it, it's if it's scary for you it's so much scarier for a partner so that's you know I, I can see you grimacing and I, I absolutely understand that the thought of putting big needles into your own fistula is a very scary thing and it does frighten off a lot of people so PD as a first treatment option can be a really great way to go it can buy you time it's very gentle it's easy to learn it preserves your re residual kidney function the longest they found any treatment. So if you've got a, a transplant lined up, um, PD can be a great way to go. Or even if you just want to do PD for as long as you can, and I know some people who've done it for years and years, but mostly 
two, you know, a year, two, three years, uh, and then something will happen so PD isn't possible. But meanwhile, you've had a chance to get a fistula in, and you've had a chance to get used to taking care of yourself, and you, you get over some of those sort of um, barriers in your own mind or challenges. Dr. Agar would say he'd be mad at me for saying barriers, but you get over, you get past some of those challenges, and you, you realize that you can do it. So as an entry point, then, you're saying PD is not a bad way to start. PD is a great way to start. It's a much better way to start than doing hemo with a catheter, which is, I think, about how about 80% of people start now. Much, much better to start with PD. Okay. If you can, not everybody can do PD. Some, if you've had a lot of abdominal surgeries, if you have adhesions, although they can take a laser and they can get rid of adhesions, but um, PD can be an excellent first treatment. I know for me it wasn't an option because I had uh, polycystic kidney disease and my kidneys were just way too large and didn't allow enough space, so that's another you know, constraint there. Right. Um, coming around now to a different topic, Dory, and looking at um, the cost issue, when you look at the um, different modalities, is there a cost difference in terms of what you're reimbursed with and also in terms of just home costs, getting your house ready and prepared for a particular modality? If you do in-center hemo, 93% uh, I think of folks who do that treatment are eligible for Medicare. And Medicare, there are three ways you can get Medicare. One way is you're over 65, one way is you're disabled, and the third way is you have kidney failure. So kidney failure can entitle you to Medicare if you have enough work credits to qualify for Social Security, and, and that varies based on age. So Medicare routinely will pay for, they'll pay 80%, they don't pay 100%, but they'll pay 80% for three hemo treatments in a week, and it doesn't say how long they, they can be. So Medicare will full out pay their 80% if you do nocturnal hemo at home, three times a week, you do it every other night, probably your doctor can get a letter to do that. You're not going to really probably notice a lot of difference in the cost to you other than possibly the electricity bill and, and maybe the water bill. But that's going to be offset by a lower gasoline bill because you're not going to be going to and from the clinic every single day or every other day. So peritoneal dialysis, Medicare pays for it basically the same rate as they do for in-center hemo. So they're going to pay 80% for that. Whether you do PD or you do home hemo, the machine is going to be paid for by the clinic, and so will the supplies. You do not have to buy a machine to do dialysis at home. That's not your responsibility. That's the clinics. They lease it, and they put it in your house. And if they put it in your house, it does not mean you own it. So if you say you started doing PD and you got a transplant, you don't own that cycler. You cannot sell it on eBay. It goes back to the clinic. But um, as far as the costs, Really, the cost to you, not that different. The, the one case where you may end up paying more is if you do short daily hemo and you do more than three treatments a week because that's what short daily is. Um, if you, since you're doing more than three treatments a week, you may be paying a copay on more than three treatments per week. It's also a good idea to look at your insurance because we are aware of some health plans where they try to charge you for every PD exchange, and that can add up in a big hurry. Um. Dory, I've, you've covered um, the modalities and you've covered the different issues, um, <clears throat> lifestyle issues, at least some of them, um, that would guide your choice. You've also covered some of the issues with regard to the effectiveness of treatment. Um, in our closing here, can you sum up for us the empowered patient, whether it be dialysis or newly diagnosed or somewhere in between, how they should use your book to improve their outlook and their lifestyle, both in terms of health and lifestyle. Sure. We did a study some years back where we did some focus groups with people who had chosen um, a, a type of home hemo and people who were at the same clinics and were offered it but they didn't choose it. And there was one big difference between those two groups and that difference was confidence. The folks who went home felt confident that they could do it. And so the purpose of this book, really, overall, is to help you be more confident that you could do it. Lots of people do it. There are stories in the book for each type of treatment. And there is no reason why, if you want to do this, you couldn't succeed. So that's really, to me, 
sort of the overarching goal. But you know, you can use it as a reference. There's an index at the back. You can look up anything that you want to. You can go chapter by chapter. You can read the whole thing as a novel or not. It, hopefully it won't put you to sleep, but it, it should. <laughs> I don't think I would just read it from cover to cover and I wrote it. So, you know, use it as a reference. Use it to help you understand, you know, if, if you have a particular interest, you want to have a baby, or you want to stay out of the hospital, you, you want to do whatever, you can follow that lifestyle element through every single treatment option and see how each one would affect you. So hopefully it has a lot of uses. Well, thank you, Dory. That was uh, an excellent uh, talk. Um, thank you for the information. Um, I'd also like to remind you that uh, we, Dory, will take questions that are submitted through our website, again, theakp.org, uh, for the event, search for the event, and in the comments section you can post questions and we will have Dory back specifically to answer some of those questions. Uh, I thank you and I thank uh, Dory and uh, I look forward to all of you joining at, at joining us at one of our new events. Thanks, Patrick.